and you may be seated. Good morning. This is going to be a really, really good day, guys. All right, I'm just telling you, this is going to be a good day. We're baptizing 18 today, all right? So uh, 10 in this service, 8 in the next service. I don't know about you, but for church, it just doesn't get better than that, all right? Uh, so it's an exciting day for us. And there are other good things that are going on around here today. Tim Belcher, you have a very special young man sitting on your row. And I don't do this, and I know that I probably would not embarrass him if I do this. All right, please introduce him, all right? All the way from Cape Town, South Africa. Woo! All right. Emmanuel, welcome today. All right, good to have you. A very special guest. All right. It is terrific, terrific. So uh, many of you have met their daughter before. She's been in service with us. She's been in mission projects in Uganda with an orphanage, prison work, and met a wonderful gentleman there who loves Jesus and loves her immensely. And we're excited to have him in our country for a short period. You're leaving next week, aren't you? Yeah, all right. Well, come back again, all right? Thanks for being here today. If you are a guest, uh, whether you've come from South Africa or South Fresno, uh, we are happy to have you here. And uh, there's a card in the pew in front of you. We would love for you to fill it out, put it in the offering bag when it comes by later. Next week, not through the mail, not on the phone. We won't bother you that way. But um, what did I just say? <laughs> Yeah, through the mail is the way we will bother you, not by coming to your door or calling you on the phone, but through the mail, we'll send you some information that tells you about the church, hopefully answer most of your questions, but it's our joy to have you here. Those cards are also for our regular members. If you've got uh, messages to our staff, if you have uh, prayer requests, answers to prayer, please write that on there, drop it in the offering bag. Every Tuesday morning, we go through every one of those cards. Steve and Laura Lee Brown, would you stand please as well? All right, Steve and and Laura Lee. Everybody wave at them. All right? Wave at them. That is not a hello wave. That's a goodbye wave. They leave us this week. All right? Uh, oh, don't say ah. They're moving to Cambria. All right? Don't say ah. You can say oh. All right? But uh, anyway, uh, leaving us for uh, Cambria. So be praying for them in this transition. Houses close this week and moving takes place this week. And so be praying for them as they go through that. May I direct your attention to the screen and see our morning announcements. Hello, ladies. Saturday, September 1st is our women's summer event. Amy Barnes will be joining us for an evening filled with laughter, fun, and fellowship. We're also going to have ice cream and door prizes, and we're going to raffle off a Choose Joy quilt. So don't miss it. It's going to be a lot of fun. The tickets are $15. Come that evening and bring a friend. Hope to see you there. Hi, I'm Bill. And I'm Lindsay. We host college and young adults Bible study at our home every Thursday night. The Bible study usually starts around 7, 7.15, and we usually end around 8.30. You can come early hang out, and then afterwards we usually have dessert and kids just stick around and talk. It's a safe place to come and delve into God's Word with people of your own age. Love to have you there. Thank you. Men's breakfast is coming up the second Saturday of the month. Starts at 8 o'clock, coffee's on at 7.30, so come along and enjoy some good food and fellowship. September 9th is going to be a very special day for us at New Hope. Over the last 10 years, we have been engaged in ministry in the Ivory Coast, Cote d'Ivoire of Africa. Uh, we have taken a team in every year for the last 10 years to share with 1040i and Mike Cousineau. They are going to be with us on September the 9th for all three of our Sunday morning services and our Sunday evening service. If you want to know more about what's going to take place this next February, I hope you'll come and join us that Sunday. Our ministry with 1040i is a wonderful experience. We get to engage in medical outreach, evangelistic outreach, and construction projects. So if you have an interest in having an overseas experience in mission work, show up September the 9th, hear about this trip, and maybe this will be just for you. 
We have a Thursday morning men's Bible study. It meets at 6 a.m. and it concludes at 6.45. So if you're retired, you get up early, you can go home and take a nap. If you are part of the working group, uh, we get you out of here in time to, to get to the job. But we're going to be kicking off a brand new study the Thursday after Labor Day. So if you are looking for a place to connect, if you're looking to get better acquainted with other men, if you're looking to do a deeper Bible study, we would love to have you check out Thursday morning, early morning Bible study, 6 to 6.45 every single Thursday. Family nights are starting again. Wednesday, September the 12th, there'll be adult and kids Bible studies. The kids this session are going to spend seven weeks learning about the life of Jacob through various slime experiences. We're going to make lots of slime. That's for our preschool through fourth grade students. And of course, our fifth and sixth graders are still meeting every week as well. If you're a parent and you're dropping off a kid for the kids studies, or you're just an adult that wants to go to a Wednesday night adult Bible study, then I'll be doing Forgotten God by Francis Chan. It's a chance to talk about the Holy Spirit and find out how we can re-engage with the Holy Spirit in our lives. And that goes from 7 to 8, the same time as the kids' sessions. We also have dinner at 6.15 for anyone that wants to come that's going to these Bible studies. If you're interested in doing Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University, the nine-week class starts on September the 16th. It's at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoons, and there's a sign-up sheet going around today. To get more information on these and other upcoming events, visit newhopechurch.net. So how many of you would like to sign up for the spike ball tournament this coming Friday night? Actually, that sign-up sheet is on the clipboard, all right? It's underneath the financial piece. Uh, it's not age prohibitive, all right? So uh, they'll teach you how to play the game. It's short notice. It's going to be this coming Friday. Uh, something the college group is doing out here for a social event. Rick, uh, Rick is going to be leaving us. He is heading uh, to Ravencrest for a year of Bible school in Colorado. And uh, Ivy, another one of the kids out of our high school group now in college age, is going to be going to the Joshua uh, Wilderness Program, which is a year of Bible study up at Hume Lake. All right, so uh, a couple of our young people are spreading their wings and looking at what God has in store for them in a very unique way, and we're excited about that. Um, let me hit some prayer requests, and then we are going to uh, have our offering and sing, and we're our, our baptismal candidates for this service during that first song that comes up next. They'll head out that side door, get ready, uh, meet us at that side door when we're ready to go, okay? Um, let me hit just a couple of things that I need to remind you about. Five o'clock today, uh, Sunday evening worship over in the bridge building. Mark will be wrapping up his three-week Sermon on the Mount series, so would love to have you there for that. We have 16 people from our church up in Redwood City. They are helping Prison Fellowship put on their Angel Tree Sports Camp. It's a football camp. Uh, foot, uh, prison Fellowship started this several years ago. The uh, only camp like this was being done in Redwood. It got started by a, a coach who teamed up with Prison Fellowship to want to do something for uh, kids who have particular challenges. And the challenges these kids have is they have one or both of their parents incarcerated. And uh, at Christmas time, we give these kids a gift in the name of their incarcerated parent and the love of Jesus Christ. And this is kind of a middle year contact with them. They can sign up through Prison Fellowship Angels Tree Outreach Program. They are bused from here as well as surrounding areas around Wood City, uh, around Redwood City, and retired professional football players, most of them 49ers or Oakland Raiders, show up. They are people who have faith in Jesus Christ. They put on a sports clinic. It takes people from New Hope and other churches in the area to go up, help run the sports program for the day. These men and women share their faith in Jesus Christ with these young people. They are fed and uh, they are sent out with a spiritual challenge about a relationship with Jesus Christ. There'll be about 400 elementary age kids up there today. So 16 from New Hope are there helping pull this off. And so you might be praying for them throughout the day. All right. Let me uh, hit a couple of prayer requests and then we'll get engaged in the rest of our morning. Uh, Judith Ashby, part of our church family here. Her mom passed away, Julia Checkets, and that's her 
service is going to be this Wednesday at uh, Fresno Memorial Gardens. Donna Scow is uh, a resident of Clovis. And uh, Donna passed away, and her service is going to be on the 31st at Boyce. And then tomorrow, right here at 1030, John Miller from our own church. His service is tomorrow at 1030. You are welcome to come share in that service as well. Uh, Marianne Levendusky that we've been praying for since the beginning of the year. She's diagnosed with cancer. It's a very unusual type, very quick-growing tumors. Uh, her cancer responded, as you know very well, to the treatment so much that uh, it was down to one tumor to an appropriate size that at Stanford they removed it in the middle of the summer and when she left there the doctor said for anybody who's had what you have you are as close to cancer free as anybody that we know she got to enjoy that for about six weeks and as I shared last week, the tumor started showing up again. Uh, it shut down her kidneys two weeks ago. Uh, they got them r functional again, uh, but this week uh, they're not working as well. She's back in the hospital. Now that's the bad news. Here's the good news. The Levendusky family has been part of New Hope for about six or seven years now. And over that period of time, uh, every member of their family has come to know Christ. Uh, this is a big family, both uh, how many of them there are and how big they are, <laughs> all right? Uh, and all of them had come to faith in Jesus Christ except for Marianne's husband, Jim. Big guy, retired guy. Uh, you can't help but love this guy. He tries to act like he's mean, <laughs> but he's a big teddy bear, all right? Uh, earlier this year, he had to go in the hospital. He was in ICU. Uh, death was knocking pretty seriously on his door. I had a conversation with him in ICU. Uh, he, for the first time, he allowed me to pray with him. I am not sure whether that was medication or not. Uh, but anyway, we, we talked about some things. And then... Um, he can start coming to church after that, and he'll stand in the back back there in the foyer and stare at me through the window back there, and uh, sometimes he makes faces at me, but uh, just a terrific gentleman. Uh, when she went back in this week, I had an opportunity to visit with uh, the son and daughter um, outside of the room, and all of us agreed that Marianne is not afraid to die. She's ready. Not, 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 her biggest concern is her husband. And um, I, I related to uh, both the son and the daughter, the conversation in the hospital, and I said, I'm not real sure where that is. We need to nail this down. I said, Marianne needs to know. And um, I said, you know, I, I don't mind doing that, but I think if God provides an opportunity for either one of you as his grown kids to have this conversation, it would be really good. And uh, so Mark said, you know what? I'm staying at my dad's house tonight. I'm ready. I said, okay. So, God, th that's human wisdom coming up with a plan. But God had a different plan. I left because there were a lot of people there at that moment uh, seeing her that she'd worked at ECU for 30 some odd years. And uh, so I left and I came back about five hours later. When I came back, I walked into the room and here is Jim sitting next to Mary Ann at her bedside. They're holding hands and they've got their heads bowed like they're praying. So I didn't want to interrupt. I really wasn't sure if they were praying or napping. But um, uh, I waited. A few moments later, Marianne opened her eyes. She said, oh, Pastor Tim, how did you do that? And I said, what? And they said, we were just talking about you. We were hoping you would get back. And I said, well, man, I, it's great when people are excited to see me like this. Thanks. It doesn't often happen that way. And she said, no, Jim just told me he wants to pray the sinner's prayer. And we said, maybe you'll show up and help us. And I looked at him, and he stood right up, and he said, would you show me how? And we all joined hands around her bed, and this big old guy in a loud voice, he said, you, t you say it, I'll repeat it. So I gave him a few words, and in the loudest voice almost he could, he invited Jesus Christ in his life. And so that, this has been a really, really good week, man. Um, and so Mary Ann said, if, I, if they can get my kidneys working enough, we'll both show up and be baptized Sunday. And I told them, even if it wasn't this Sunday, we'd make a baptism happen, all right, for the two of them. So uh, that was great and exciting news. Reba Chamberlain, 93 years old, part of our 8 o'clock service. Uh, she's been in the hospital and now is in a care facility this week. 
She has outlived all of her siblings. She does not have any children of her own. She does not have a spouse. She is, we are her family. We are her family. And so she is at uh, Pacific Gardens. We're going to try the first part of the week to find a closer and a better facility for her. And uh, she's hoping to get back to her own home. She owns her own home. And so we hope to get her back there. So please be praying for Reba. I was handed another request. Pray for Frank Stockton. He has been diagnosed with bladder cancer, and they're waiting for pathology this week. So those are a few of the updates. Okay. Um, when I call your name, would you stand up real quick? Mark, Scott, Charlotte, Scott, Karen Haynes, Diana Mays, Dennis Mays, Jaden Ingalls, all right, Amy Wilson, McKenna Herman, did I say it right? Okay. Sienna, did I say it right? All right, Zachlin, Lucy Addis. These are the 10 who are going to be baptized in this morning's service, all right? So uh, give them a round of applause, all right? It's good to get to share in this. You all may go out those doors and get ready for the adventure of your life, all right? Um, for those of you who may be a guest today and you wonder what in the world is going on and why does Tim act like he's so excited, uh, this is kind of like a birthday party. This is sort of like an anniversary celebration. Um, every one of those men, women, and young people have had the same thing happen to them, and that is they have invited Jesus Christ in their life. Um, they're being baptized not to become a Christian. They are being baptized because they are a Christian. You see, what it means to be a Christian is we recognize that there's something missing in our life and that something missing is God. And the reason he's missing is because there's this thing that nobody likes to talk about in the 21st century, but it's called sin. It's called this idea that I can live my life independent of God and I can control my own destiny. And that works sometimes until you die. And then you got a problem. And so... Uh, Jesus came to remedy that problem. That's what the story of Christmas and the story of Easter is all about. It is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what God did on our behalf so that Jesus can come now live in us in spite of the fact that we have sin in our nature. When we appropriate his forgiveness that comes from the cross, we now become a Christian. The Bible says it this way. We must believe in our heart and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and we will be saved. And baptism is a public testimony of this very personal private decision that we have made in our lives. Jesus set the example when he allowed his cousin John the Baptist to baptize him at the beginning of his ministry. And then John is the one who continued to preach the message of repent and receive Jesus and be baptized. And so that is what we are sharing in today. The symbolism is this. When we place somebody underneath the water is a picture of what the Bible says that we were born physically dead in our trespasses and sins. At our birth, physical life, but no spiritual life. The scripture then says, we are raised in the newness of life. You must be born again. And coming out of the water is the picture of that new birth that we have already experienced because Jesus lives within us. And what made all of that possible is the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we give testimony to his physical death and resurrection because it is what paid the debt of our sin so we can have spiritual life. Perfect sense, right? If it's very confusing, ask me after church. I'd love to talk to you about it. But that's what all of these are going to be sharing. And some of our Sunday school kids have come over to join us to watch their friends be baptized today. So at this time, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Uh, the worship team is going to come back out and lead us in a worship song while we prepare for baptism. Uh, would you please join with us as we pray? Father, I want to thank you for the life that you offer to us. That life is not one that says, just because you invite me to come forgive you of your sin and live within your life, that your life will be perfect from this moment on. But what you do promise us is that you will never leave us nor forsake us in this life. 
so that as we face the challenges, the difficulties, the troubles, the frustrations, and the problem of life, we have one who says, I'll give you peace that passes understanding in the midst of all of your troubles. I will give you joy that cannot be expressed in human language because of what you're going through. And so you promise us your presence through the problems of this life. You promise us your leadership as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And you promise to be with us forever in all of eternity. It's the best deal I've ever been offered. And I'm so glad. I am so glad that you offered it to me. And thank you, Father, for these 10 men and women and young people who have accepted the same offer of a forgiven life and an everlasting life. And they are given testimony today as we share together in baptism. Father, thank you for the privilege of giving and sharing today. Thank you for the way in which you meet our needs, not only personally, but as a church family. And that you enable us to make a difference in lives literally around the world. Father, thank you for uh, the comfort that you've brought to those who've experienced loss recently. And thank you for those that you are comforting at this very moment. Like the Miller family and uh, the Scow family and the Ashby family, Lord. We, we're so grateful for your presence that's available to them. For other needs and challenges that are going on, we commit them to you. For the Levandusky family and the process they're going through at this very moment, we commit it to you. Thank you for uh, pursuing Jim, Lord, until he finally lets you catch him. And thank you that we got to, uh, to be there and watch that happen. Thank you for the privilege of today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Bless you, Tim. You may be seated. And that last song adequately describes what this morning has all been about. Uh, let me see if we've got them in here yet so I can give these two. Mark and Charlotte Scott, are you in here yet? They're not in here yet. All right, Karen. Oh, oh, there we go. All right. Thank you, Diana and Dennis. There you are. Thank you all so much. Jaden and Amy. All right, uh, the girls probably went to Sunday school, didn't they? Are they in here, McKenna? All right, I, I just looked a little behind me there, huh? Sienna, here she comes. Lucy. All right, she's a, and Mark and Charlotte, if you'd hand that to your Mark, and he can give it to them when they come in back there. All right, guys, do you realize I have nine minutes to preach a sermon? <laughs> And I'm probably taking 15. <laughs> Just to set the framework for today. Um, if you were not here last week, I'm so sorry. Uh, watch the video, all right? Because I'm going to try to finish today what we didn't finish last week. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is the best chapter in all of the Bible to help us understand the resurrection. If you're new today, it's your first time. We've been in a series since the beginning of summer called What's Up With Heaven? I believe it's important to know about heaven, this place that we're going. The Bible says it's better than the place that we are leaving. Uh, if you talk about a subject of heaven, there are at least two other subjects you have to talk a little bit about. One of them is death. Why? Because you have to die to get to heaven, all right? So you can't help but talk a little bit about death. And number two, uh, if you talk about heaven, you've got to talk about hell. Because you can't have heaven without hell. Because the same Bible that talks about heaven talks four times as much about hell. And so it is a reality that we need to avoid, and heaven is a reality that we need to gain. And so uh, as we've been involved in this series, we've looked at those subjects, and now we're tackling some of the questions that many of you submitted the first two weeks of the study. And some of the questions that we're looking at right now is, is, is what are we going to look like in heaven? Are we going to have real bodies? Are people going to recognize us? Will we have memories? And so those are some of the questions that we are tackling between last week and this week. I remember as a a, um, as a kid, my dad, I was probably seven or eight years old, and my dad took me to, a, a, oh, we would call him now a seminar, but it, it was a, a preacher encouraging pastors. His name was Charles Tremendous Jones, okay? And, and, he would, and, and the reason he had that nickname is because he would come out on stage and he would say, life is tremendous! 
And he would do that far more exaggerated than I just did, all right? I mean, it was very exaggerated. And he was about six foot four. And uh, he certainly got your attention when he did that. But Charles Tremendous Jones said, all of us can share our testimony in 15 seconds or less. Here is Charles Tremendous Jones' testimony. I am not what I used to be. I am not yet what one day I shall be. But by the grace of God and the blood of Jesus, I shall become what I'm supposed to be. And that is good. And Jim Levendusky this past week can use that as his testimony now. Every one of those you saw in the baptistry today, this is your testimony. And just as your son asked, does this mean I can go to heaven? Not because he was baptized, but because he's invited Jesus Christ to life. The answer to that question is yes. And when we have a firm understanding of that yes answer, it makes us better ready to die because we are better prepared for heaven. So let's look quickly. Was Jesus' resurrection spiritual or physical? And I am going to tell you, it was both. We were born spiritually dead, and because of spiritual death, we physically die. So since there were two deaths, there needed to be two resurrection. God does things very symbolically. He does it very orderly. And so we know it was physical. Uh, Paul declared in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, by now Christ has been raised from the dead. And Paul offered to the Corinthian church, remember the Corinthian church was in bad shape. They had gone off into bad truth. They had distorted the purpose and the plan of God. And Paul had to write two lengthy letters to set them straight. And that's why I believe that 1 Corinthians 15 is the best chapter, 52 or 54 verses, all about the resurrection. But Paul let them know that Jesus appeared to many people after his resurrection. On the day of his resurrection, Jesus appeared five times to Mary Magdalene, to other women, to Peter himself, to a couple of disciples on the road to Emmaus, and to the ten disciples without Judas, who had committed suicide, and for some reason uh, Thomas was not present with them. Over the next 39 days, Jesus presented himself uh, to his disciples six different times. To the 11 disciples, including Thomas, he appeared again in John chapter 20. To seven disciples by the Sea of Galilee in John chapter 21. In 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Paul said he appeared before 500 other citizens of the city of Jerusalem. He appeared in 1 Corinthians 15, 7 to James, his half-brother. Uh, Matthew 28 says he appeared to the 11 disciples at the Sea of Galilee, and to the 11 disciples at the Ascension in Jerusalem. All this recorded in Mark, Luke, and Acts. And before the final book of the Bible was written, Jesus appeared an additional six times to Stephen when he is being stoned to death in Acts 7, to Saul on his road to Damascus when he became a Christian. He appeared to Saul, whose name now became Paul, uh, in Arabia, in the Jewish temple, when he was incarcerated in Caesarea. And then he appeared to the gospel writer John as he writes the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation from the Isle of Patmos. You see, Jesus did more than just show up and say, Shalom, y'all. Jesus conversed with his disciples on 17 occasions. He ate with them at three different times. He had separate encounters on various occasions. He even showed up a second time to the 11 because once there was only 10 and Thomas said, I will not believe until I touch the scars in his hand and his side. And when Jesus showed up in the room, Thomas said, I don't need to touch you. You are my Lord and you are my God. Somebody figured this out. Let me, let me, let me first of all set it up. Let's say in an audience this size, I showed up for the very first time. I told you that Jesus was raised from the dead. What would most of you do? You would probably laugh at me. Yeah, I'm talking about if this was back then. If I told you, hey, the guy we buried four days ago, I had dinner with him last night. That's exactly what y'all would do. But what if I told you then 
There's three people on this side, and there's about six people on this side who were with me that night and had dinner with us. What would you now do? Would you believe me yet? Maybe. What would you do? You would go talk to them, wouldn't you? This is exactly what Paul's telling the folks in Corinth to do. Almost all these apostles are still living. Go ask them. 500 people in Jerusalem saw him, visited with him. Go ask the eyewitnesses yourselves. There's plenty of evidence to prove to you he is risen from the dead. And somebody said if we took everybody who saw Jesus after he was raised from the dead, we gave them a chance to give a 15-minute testimony about their faith in Jesus Christ, we would be here all day today and all night, all day tomorrow and all night, all day Tuesday and all night, all day Wednesday. The last guy would finish sometime Friday morning. That's a preponderance of evidence all agreeing to the very same thing. Well, what was Jesus' body like post-resurrection versus pre-resurrection? Well, we know it was different, yet similar. We know it was different because, and this is a part I love. I, I don't know how this is going to work, but i got to be honest, folks. I love this part. He could just pop into a room and pop out of a room. Star War, Star Trek, okay? Beam me up, Scotty, okay? That kind of stuff. He just materialized and dematerialized in rooms. It's in the Gospels, Luke chapter 24, John chapter 20. You can find it where all of a sudden do doors were shut and closed and Jesus pops in. He finishes his conversation, Jesus pops out. Husbands, you do that often with your wives, but you're physically still there. It's just mentally you've checked out. All right? I mean, just now imagine him being able to do that the other way. There was something similar about Jesus' body because people would recognize him when they saw him, and yet there was something not quite the same because sometimes they didn't recognize him immediately. On the road to Emmaus, they chatted with him for a while before all of a sudden, either the way he said a word or some movement of his hand, oh, you're Jesus. <laughs> so there is similarities, and yet there are differences between pre- and post-resurrection. Well, that brings us to the question, what will our bodies be like? John wrote in 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. And Paul wrote in Colossians 1, 18, that Jesus' resurrection was the firstborn from the dead. And that word firstborn in its Greek word is where we get our English word prototype. When you build a new car or a new airplane, the first one you build is called a what? A prototype. And everyone after that looks very similar to that prototype. That's the pattern. And that is what Paul is saying is true about us. So what are the specific ways that our new resurrected bodies will be in conformity with the body of the glory of Jesus Christ? Number one, our bodies will be physical, all right? We're not just going to be some disembodied Casper, all right? We will have a body. He talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15, 39 through 41. We will have bodies, yet it will be different. You see, our earthly bodies decay, but our heavenly bodies will endure. Our earthly bodies are infected with sin, not time for a long theological lesson here, but it's appropriate time for me to throw this in. The reason that some of you will die with cancer, the reason that some of you may catch another disease, the reason that you may end up with carotid arteries is because we have been infected by sin. Not specifically a sin that you have done, but because of the sin Adam and Eve committed in the beginning of time, we live in a world. The, the, the reason there is pollution in the world, the reason that animals don't get along with each other, the reason there is chaos is because there is sin in the world. I don't care how well we try to incorporate laws and organizations and institutions, we're never going to eliminate it. We can slow it down at times, we can reduce its effect for a period of time, but ultimately... It will be that which destroys us. There are sometimes sickness and illnesses we get because of things we've done to our own body. Sometimes it is our fault, okay? Um, I don't mean to pick on smokers. Forgive me. You, you know I enjoy a good cigar every once in a while. In fact, I'm hoping to tonight. <laughs> but 
But you know what? If you, if, if you smoke two packs a day, don't be shocked if you get lung cancer. And then you could be like my mother and never have smoked a cigarette once in your life and never have a bit of alcohol ever in your life, a teetotaler on both ends, and yet she died with emphysema and cirrhosis of the liver. A very rare disease. Why? Because this is a sinful world and it has infected our bodies. That's the reality of life in this world. But the next body, the heavenly one, will be free of sin. Our earthly bodies are weak. Our heavenly bodies will be powerful. Our earthly bodies are for this old world. Our heavenly bodies will be for the new one. Number two, our bodies will be perfect. Doesn't that sound good? Do you remember last week I asked you guys to do something for me? How many of you did what I asked you to do last week? Thank you for being so cooperative. Uh, I, of course, I don't blame you. I don't like doing it. I, do you remember what I asked you all to do last week? Yeah, oh yeah, you remember it. Yeah, you do. I asked you to stand naked in front of a mirror w- with nobody in the room, all right? Yeah. If you haven't done that in a long time, you probably didn't recognize what you saw, okay? Because you, you had one vision, all right, of what it used to look like, and it ain't looking like that anymore. Just again, fulfilling biblical truth, our bodies outwardly are wasting away, but inwardly we are being renewed day by day. When we get to heaven, our bodies will be perfect from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet. My son will not have two longer toes than his big toe, all right, on his foot anymore. It'll be perfectly laid out. Can you imagine somebody like Johnny Erickson Tata, who since the age of 18 has been a quadriplegic? Can you imagine how thrilled she will be when she gets to heaven? Can you imagine somebody who has had, um, oh my goodness, any, any number of diseases, cerebral palsy, what it's going to be like for them to get to heaven? Plastic surgeons, you will have nothing to do in heaven, <laughs> nothing. You Mary Kay sales rep, you are not needed in heaven <laughs> as a sales rep. I'm sorry. You see, we won't have to try to look beautiful. Every one of us will be beautiful. We'll all be tens, but we'll be the ten that we… You're still going to recognize me, but there won't be any blemishes and there won't be any bulges, and it's going to be good. And last of all, our bodies will be personal. Our body, our memories, our gifts, our talents, our passions, our spirit, are what makes us us. In the resurrection, we will be us perfected in the twinkling of an eye. It happens just like that. This was Jesus' point when he appeared to his disciples after the resurrection, and Jesus said, it is I, myself. (laughs) It's me, I. (laughs) I'm not anybody else. I'm me. And that is so special for us to remember. Let me wrap this up. You are getting one-third the sermon today. This is a true story. It's a very distinguished gentleman. He had been an elected official in his home state. And he was the only white person to ever be buried in this particular cemetery in Georgia, which had been reserved exclusively for their black community. He had lost his mama when he was just a baby boy. His father never, ever married again, but he hired a woman that had been recommended to him, a black woman named Mandy, to help him raise his son. She was a Christian, and she took this job very, very serious. Seldom was a motherless boy received so much warmth and so much love and so much attention. One of his earliest memories was of Mandy bending tenderly over him in his upstairs bedroom every morning and waking him up by saying, wake up, child. God's morning has come. Wake up, child. As the years passed, this wonderfully devoted woman continued to serve this young man as his substitute mother. He finally went off to college But when he would come home for the holidays and for his summer stay, she would be right there. She would climb those stairs every morning, a little slower now than she used to, 
But she would climb those stairs every morning and she would go into his room and she would say, wake up, child. God's morning has come. One day after he had become a very successful statesman in his state, he received the saddest message he had ever heard. Mandy is dead. Can you attend her funeral? As he stood by her grave in that cemetery that day, he turned to all of her friends and he said, if I die before Jesus comes again, I want your permission to be buried right here beside Mandy. Because what I can imagine is that on resurrection morning, she will lean over to me and say, wake up, my boy. God's morning has come. And the sentiment that man expressed at that gravesite that day rings true to those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ. But it won't be Mandy. It will be Jesus himself at the sound of a great trumpet who will say, Awake, my children! Our morning has come. That is the hope of everyone who knows Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, for this day, we are so grateful. If there's someone who has joined us this day, this celebration day for our church, and they don't have a personal relationship with you, I pray that through the symbolism of what they saw, they have seen and heard enough to know that it's not enough just to say, oh yeah, Jesus lived, died, and rose again. But you want us to choose you. You've chosen us. That's what you did on the cross. You've chosen every one of us. You're waiting for our answer. And Lord, I trust there's someone who's answering you today. No fancy prayer, no special formula, just an honest confession. Jesus, I want you to come live within my life. I want to hear some glad morning. The day has arrived. Jesus has come. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, could you all hurry up and get out of here so the next crowd can come in?